Hola amigos, bienvenidos a una nueva edición de Juegos, Juguetes y Coleccionables. Hoy tenemos una entrevista muy interesante porque estamos ni más ni menos que con Gus López, uno de los coleccionistas más importantes de memorabilia de Star Wars, quien ha publicado varios libros, ya ha dado conferencias por todo el mundo. Y bueno, pues, Gus, hi, welcome to the show. Thank you, thanks for having me on. So, first things first, how do you start this? Yeah, I mean, it started gradually. Like, I started with the action figures as a kid when Star Wars came out. And then once I had all the ac all the toys, I had to get find out more. And so I started getting the store displays and then the toy prototypes. And, and I wanted to learn more and more about everything around Star Wars toys. So you have not only toys, you have props, um, things uh, that made the films yeah. like they were. What was the first thing? when when? When you had this first chance to get something else than uh, everybody can have? Yeah, it's hard to say the first time, but there were a number of steps along the way where that happened. Uh, 18 years ago, I had the chance to buy the model of the Death Star used in the first Star Wars. And, uh, and I thought about it at the time and I said, I don't really collect this kind of thing, but it's so unique, it's one of a kind, it's so iconic. And so I, I said, I'm going to buy this thing. And, and then um, since then, it's been like chase one thing after another when I see unique items that come up or, or that I know about and, and try to find those things. You said 18 years ago? Yeah, 18. So it was like 20, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, yeah, 1999 when I, when I bought, the, bought the Death Star. And, you know, how, how does the studios get to sell all those things? I mean, yeah, well, for, for yeah, for now the studios are smarter about it. So now studios do their own auctions or have their own archives. But back then, studios were careless, and so they would throw things away. They would keep things in storage. They they, they things got lost. So there were a lot of things that surfaced. Uh, so this model came out directly from ILM. Yeah, from ILM, yes. It's the only three-dimensional three model of the Death Star used in Star Wars. It's about a meter in diameter, so it's a huge model, and it lights up with like lots of little, thousands of little points of light, so if you put light inside of it, it does the effect of the lit-up Death Star. So it's an amazing piece, and I have other pieces that are, are pretty good too, but that was one of the first big ones, which was like one-of-a-kind, super important in Star Wars. Where do you store that thing? Well, that's funny, like when we bought it, um, my wife and I were in a small apartment, we didn't have room for it, so we had to keep it in storage. And a year later we bought our house, but we drove our uh, real estate agent crazy because we had to buy a house that had a space for the Death Star. So when we got our house, we had the front area had this perfect location for the Death Star. So people will walk into our house, the first thing they see is the Death Star. Thank God there was not a storage uh, wars, shows and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah, that's, that would not be good. Yeah. So you um, became one of the first, um, uh, first users of the internet to bring people together because internet back then in 1984 wasn't that. Right, right, like, yeah, um, that's one thing that I think, um, while there were a lot of collectors when Star Wars first came out who were older and had the money to buy a lot of things, what I thought was interesting of the kids that grew up with Star Wars, they were, who were younger, like, people my age, like, when they, when they started to get back into collecting, they were the first to really use the internet, and so I, I did in the 90s just was, you know, leveraged it to do things like connect with collectors all over the world, to uh, share information, and so it let us really grow really fast in Star Wars collecting. Not just my own personal uh, information and background, but help everybody else out, learn a lot from each other. And I think the internet was profound in changing the way we do collecting. Yeah, I mean, now it, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be, um, I, w I wanna be, be uh, more um, uh, clear on this point because nowadays you can talk about the internet, and it's something you get to, you grant uh, you, you get for granted. Yes. But back then, '94, yeah. you can only get online if you were in a in a college. Right. I was at university, and I I, uh, I created my website, which was the first Star Wars collecting website on the internet. And you get one of those crazy addresses, like it was uh, HTTP, like <laughs> one two three four dot. Yeah, URL. yeah. Oh, it was a very long URL to get to the website. I didn't have a domain name for it yet, and. Um, and what was funny was at the time in 94, people thought it was crazy to have a website dedicated to Star Wars collecting. They thought, why would you do one on something so specialized? You, Because the website, there were like two or three Star Wars websites, but it was like everything Star Wars, like cosplay and collecting and 
and fan fiction and everything. And I was like, no, we want to focus it on Star Wars collecting. And of course, now there's like hundreds of Star Wars collecting websites. It's a very rich area for lots of different specializations. But at the time, nobody was doing a website about Star Wars collecting. So it allowed, you know, being the first to do it allowed us to just pioneer a lot of things that people hadn't done before because nobody's ever done a Star Wars web collecting website before. Now you have books. Yes. A lot of books. Yes, I've yeah, co-authored several books now and edited some books as well. So I brought a couple of them here to the show. Uh, I brought the toy-related ones. So I have one here on the Star Wars Micro Collection, which was a set of uh, small play sets and figurines that Kenner made uh, and sold in the US, Canada, and Australia. They didn't sell very well, but they're very popular collectors, especially the prototypes that come from this particular toy line. And then the other book we have is on Star Wars toy prototypes. And so this is around all the vintage uh, prototypes made by Kenner and Kenner's affiliates. And so this shows a lot of toy concepts that were never released for Star Wars. And then also uh, the production process, like everything from the action figure sculpts to uh, drawings of toys to uh, molds. So everything, the packaging prototypes. And there are many uh, concepts here from the old line that they never took to the stores. Uh, they're really great ideas, but they just never went anywhere. Great ideas that we're now seeing develop in the new episodes, like Poe Dameron's X-Wing. Right? Yeah, yeah, there, there's that kind of thing too. Yeah, it's definitely uh, old ideas they come back to, like uh, like the Ralph McQuarrie's original concept sketches that are now being applied to Force Awakens and Last Jedi. And, uh, and But yeah, it's surprising that anything with Star Wars ever gets Uh, discarded or thrown away because you think like they do like with Star Wars toys especially you think well anything they can make they're gonna make because it, it always sells but there were actually a lot of ideas that they thought wouldn't sell and so they, they never made them well, actually one idea that probably it's something crazy it's making a book about this about um, the, the the packages and, and, and the variation how when 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 you decide that this this could be something worth to be in a book Yeah, well, uh, you know, I was working to co-author on this with me, Duncan Jenkins. He and I both collect prototypes, and a lot, you know, we've done several books together, and we usually try to pick a topic that we think would be interesting, um, that there, that you know, enough people would be interested in, but that has never been covered before. And for some of these topics, like the micro collection or the prototype book, we have very unique collections that nobody else could cover the same material. Like, so for the prototype book, this is just material from our collections. And our collections have enough of this stuff that we can do a whole book on it. Um, and not many, there aren't many other collectors that can, could do that. And definitely for a lot of the things here are one of a kind, so no one else can do some of the things in here. So it was more like, look, what is the unique thing we can do because of our collections and our, inf our knowledge? And, and that's how we chose these topics. Now you have something, um new coming up i mean we have uh, i mean for uh, during years we had just three movies yeah now we have six yeah seven yeah maybe eight yeah but we have new trilogy we have new yeah. sets we have everything new what, yeah. what 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 do you think you will do with this new trilogy as far as like collecting like what what the, like, you know, yeah, any plan you have Yeah, well, I, you know, there's some things that I continue to do uh, with the new Star Wars movie. So um, I love visiting the filming locations. So I've visited several of the ones from Episode 7 already, um, like the island where Rey uh, goes to meet Luke uh, in Ireland. I've gone there. And then the, the forest where uh, Kylo Ren confronts Rey. I visited that location. And then the you Resistance. Visit the station. location? Yeah. Uh, way, um, later. They, after, they, after, they after they film. Film. And then I had, I actually had, And this is through, you know, all these years of, of doing so much in Star Wars, through some friends of mine and contacts. I actually got on the set of Pinewood Studios while they were filming Episode 7. So I saw them film the movie uh, on set. I saw it, which was amazing experience. To see them film an actual Star Wars movie was, was an incredible. I don't think I'll ever get a chance to ever do that again, but it was it was awesome. Uh, but yeah, I like to visit the locations. I'll continue to do that as they do more films. Um, like they filmed Last Jedi in Dubrovnik um, in, in Europe, and I'm going to go probably visit that city at some point. Um, and then also I still collect things from the new movies, like I collect cereal boxes and I collect cast and crew memorabilia. Um, so cast and crew items, uh, which we've also done a book about, are things that only members of the film get access to. So they're gifts to film crew members or they're things that they can buy on the production of a film. And so I've, I've gotten a whole bunch of stuff already from 
Episode 8. I mean, already from Last Jedi, I already have all the crew items. And I'm starting to get the Han Solo movie crew items already. So these are like way before the film is out. They're, they've already gotten the crew items. And so I start to I collect that for the new movies. You move fast. I do move fast, yes. Of course, what's wrong with this one? <laughs> uh, just, just, just to know, I mean, your collection gets a lot of things. Um, but let's say, um, the, what, what is now the main focus? I mean, you said first you had uh, the, the, the first action figures, uh, vehicles and stuff. Now you have proto then you have prototypes. Now you have memorabilia. Yeah. What is the um, central part? I mean, what, what is the biggest part now of that collection? Yeah, so I have about eight, about eight different categories that I go very deep in. Um, but some of them I don't add very much to anymore. So like the vintage toy prototypes, there isn't a whole lot being discovered anymore. So that stays fairly stable. Um, I would say the movie props, which I'm still buying, I might buy like three to five of them a year. Not, not a lot of items, but there are a few things that come to market. And so those I'll buy in smaller quantity, but you know, a few every year. And then, the, but the ones that I'm probably most active on are the really the food collectibles, like cereal boxes, and then also cast and crew items, because those continue on as they do more Star Wars. So I'm still, those are like in terms of number of items, the ones I'm still very actively doing. But I'm not buying really any new action figures. I have a vintage action figure set. It's wonderful. There's nothing to add to it. I have the whole set, you know, so it's all done. Um, and I have um, other, cat, you know, a few other categories I collect that I don't really don't change anymore. So it's really just a couple things like cast and crew items and food items. Do you buy this zero boxes and 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 branding of uh, of Star Wars just locally, or you go international with that? I go internationally. So uh, so I actually have a room in our house that's just Star Wars cereal, and that room has about 300 different Star Wars cereal boxes, and. Uh, there, I have, though, about 2,000 different Star Wars cereal boxes from all over the world, over 100 countries. So to give an example, when Episode 7 came out, uh, and, and this is the largest Star Wars cereal collection in the world, when Episode 7 came out, I have to get all the cereals from every country in the world so that, you know, they had cereals in Thailand and South Africa in... Um, in you know in the Netherlands you know uh, in Mexico they had it everywhere so I had over 300 people all over the world looking for me I had, a, I had to keep track of like I had people in, in about over 100 countries 300 people looking for Star Wars cereals everywhere and I got them from Russia and I got I mean name the country they've probably done Star Wars cereal at some point uh, so yeah so like I am relentless at trying to find these cereals and so so I have hundreds of cereals from The Force Awakens and then Rogue One came out got they made fewer cereals for that, but then Last Jedi, I'm sure they're going to be hundreds of cereals again. So I have to get my network all set up. Oh, well, so, I mean, any reflection about this for you, Star Wars? Well, I remember, yeah, I remember when I was a kid when they had the 50th anniversary of King Kong. And I was like, oh my God, 50 years of King Kong. Are people even alive that remember King Kong? And then it was like, oh my God, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of Star Wars soon. And now I feel like ancient for like that all these years have passed because I remember as a kid thinking 50 years, that is incredible. So yeah, it is kind of crazy actually how much time is, <laughs> has really passed and, there's, and that several generations now have been into Star Wars. It isn't just the people who grew up with it. No, this is not your first time in Mexico, but this is this is the first unboxing toy convention. Yeah. So what you um, would like to say to all the people that uh, makes this uh, event? Well, I, I, what I'd like to say is I'm very impressed with the first unboxing toy convention. I know from friends who've done conventions how hard it is, the, particularly the first of a series of a convention, because you have a new theme, you, have, you don't know what kind of marketing you need to do, you know, what dealers you bring in, what guests you bring in. And it's super impressive, right? Like I'll point out some, the guest list is incredible. Like you have like actors from Star Wars films, you know, you have Jim Storange who's a Kenner toy designer, you have uh, uh, Brian and Josh from Super 7 who make a bunch of retro toys. I mean, there's some really great uh, guests that were brought here. Um, you also have some of the major licensees here like Panini and you have Hasbro here. So that's pretty awesome draw. Um, great dealer room. There's lots of incredible products. I think for particularly, I mean, it's well attended. Um, it's a great first convention. I mean, it's a great convention overall, but for first convention, I'm very impressed because uh, I know how hard it is to pull off the first of a series. So I hope they do many more toy unboxing conventions in the future.
future. And I'd love to come back to see see these again. Let's hope so because these are great. And this is our our event. This is our Super Bowl. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. It's like our Super Bowl. Yes. Good metaphor. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so, for having me. So, ya lo escucharon, los López. Aquí en Juegos Cuentes y Coleccionables, yo soy Ricardo Méndez, ahora Marisol estuvo atrás de la cámara y pues muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Yo les digo, ahí nos vemos, hasta la próxima. Chao.